All right, in this video, I'd like to go through a very specific example of creating a while loop. In the last video, we talked about the three fundamental components, the three fundamental concepts that go into every loop. And here, what I'd like to do is just to take advantage of those and to write some concrete code so that you can see what's happening. What I'd like to do is to write a loop that goes through this list. And really, all I want to do is maybe print this to the screen or something like that. But what my loop should do is visit every element, that is to say, go through this list, open every drawer, and look at the contents of the drawer. Now we know how that loop is, how that list, sorry, is going to get arranged. It starts with index zero, and then it goes to index one, and it goes to index two. Now when I do this with a list, I, um, we often say that I am iterating the list, or this is an iteration. That's maybe a word that we don't necessarily use much outside of programming, but the concept of iterating or iteration means exactly this thing. Write a loop that visits every element in a list, and that's what we mean by iteration. So we already know now what this is going to look like, right? Ice cream drawer zero has vanilla in it, ice cream one is mint, ice cream two is cookie dough. These are the fundamental concepts of a list. They're indexed by numbers. Those indexes always start at zero and they go up one by one by one. These are the fundamental properties of a list. But if I'm gonna write a loop to do this, it's probably pretty clear so far that the indexes are what the loop needs to cope with. That is to say, that somehow the initial status is going to work with those indexes, the degree of change is going to have something to do with those indexes, and the Boolean test also is going to have something to do with those indexes. Why? Because this is the fundamental property of a list. We all know it starts with zero, goes up by one, one by one by one. All right, let's think about this a little more clearly. If I want to start at the beginning of a list, we know that lists always start with zero. So therefore, in my loop, my initial status will have something to do with index equals zero, because that's where the list starts. So before I even get into my loop, that is the status or the environmental condition of the universe, is that I need to be looking at drawer zero. We also know that in a list, we increase the drawer numbers by one all the time. Python does this automatically. We don't have to tell Python to do it one by one. It just does. So my degree of change is going to be increase that value of the index by one every time I go through the loop. That seems pretty obvious too. How do I know when I'm going to finish though? That's a bigger question. Now, if I asked Python, what is the length of ice cream? It would tell me that there are three elements in that list. So that is a big clue to what I can do with my Boolean test. So the highest index in a three element list is two. And so what that means is that index will always be less than the total length of the list. And in fact, that's my Boolean test. I will continue to do this as long as the value in the bucket called index is less than the total length of my list. When index goes to three, there is no bucket, sorry, there is no drawer three. So when index equals the length of the list, that's a failing condition. My loop should fail out of that and I should not even try to look in drawer number three because there isn't one. Perfect. All right. Let's just talk through this a little more carefully. So I'm going to set up a bucket called index. The initial status of the universe is that index will contain zero because I need to look at the very beginning of the list. That's perfect. What I'm going to be looking at is this. I'm going to be looking at the list called ice cream, but instead of looking explicitly in drawer zero, I am going to look in the drawer that is pointed to 
by the current value of the bucket called index. And so what I need to do in my head is a bit of a mental substitution. I need to remember that index currently contains the number zero. So I remove the word index and I substitute the number zero. And I'm looking in ice cream drawer zero, which of course, as we can see, is vanilla. At that point, I will increment or add one to index and index becomes one. And again, I'm looking in the list called ice cream, but I'm looking in the drawer that is pointed to by the bucket called index. So I need to do the substitution again in my head. What is contained in index? It's the number one. So I substitute that in my head. Ice cream drawer one contains mint. Repeat. <laughs> now index contains the number two. I'm still looking at the list called ice cream and I'm looking at the drawer that is pointed to by the bucket called index. Mental substitution. Index contains the number two. So I do a mental substitution. I now happen to be looking at ice cream drawer two and that's cookie dough. Perfect. So my code is going to look like this. <clears throat> Footnote, if you're a programmer, don't panic yet. My code is going to look like this. I still establish my ice cream list of an element cookie dough 012. My initial status is going to be that I'm pointing to the zeroth drawer in the list. Right? So the bucket called index points to zero. My Boolean test is that I would like to continue this loop as long as the bucket called index is less than three. Because when index points to three, there is no third drawer, right? There's no, well, let me say more specifically, there's no drawer numbered three, <laughs> right? Which would be the fourth drawer. <laughs> it's the third drawer. So because there is no drawer three, therefore that test should fail. That's my Boolean test, right? And then here's my degree of change. So every time I go through this loop, I will add one to the current value of index. That's my degree of change as I go through, right? Now, again, the place where people tend to get hung up is right here because there's two variables there and they get a little, um, like a little freaked out at that moment. So we just have to do that mental substitution, right? Remember ice cream as the list is stable. It's not changing. Nothing is changing about it. You can look right up at the top line there and you can see exactly what ice cream is. I'm not changing the length of that list. I'm not adding anything. I'm not subtracting anything, right? We looked at lists before. I'm not appending anything. I'm not popping anything. I'm not doing anything. So ice cream is stable. The only part of this that changes is that variable called index. And we can look at the other parts of my loop and I notice, oh, hey, index is going to go from zero. It's going to increment by ones as long as it's less than three. So in my head, I mentally start to substitute that. Okay, I guess that's ice cream, I guess, zero, and then ice cream one, and then ice cream two, and then, hmm, when I get to ice cream three, that's going to fail. So this is the part that I think people have a little bit of confusion with at first, and you just have to learn to read that. And it's actually just a mental substitution. Now, for those of you who are programming, uh, this is not really a good idea. And in fact, it's terrible. Here's why. Because as soon as I'm done with this video lecture, what I'm doing is I'm going to the store and when I come home, this is what my ice cream list is going to look like. <laughs> I, I'm buying more. So now my ice cream inventory list has five elements in it, but I have hard coded into the Python this number three. So if I run my code again, I will see vanilla and I will see mint and I'll see cookie dough, but I will never see strawberry or Neapolitan because my loop stops too soon. So I already know though, that if I ask 
Python, what is the length of my ice cream list? It will give me the right answer. It always does. It's truthful. It will tell me that there are five elements in that list. So what happens is that my code just broke because I hard coded in a number. I assumed that my ice cream list would always be three, but what if my ice cream list changes? My assumption about my data would be wrong. I need my code to reflect more accurately the status of my freezer. And so I need to, I need to make this a little more flexible. So you know the answer. We can see the answer already here. You can see what the hint is going to be. I'm going to take out that hard-coded number three, and I'm going to put in the length of the list ice cream. And what that does is that if I go <laughs> tomorrow or later this evening and I go buy more ice cream, then my loop will still function properly and it won't break because Python is always able to calculate the correct and true and accurate length of the list called ice cream. Now, I want to talk about this and I'm going to get on a little bit of a soapbox here. So, you know, sorry about that, but this is what's important. This is a principle called abstraction. Abstraction just means that we're taking out some concrete, really specific things, and we're starting to replace them with something that's more of an idea or a concept or a representation. In this case, I'm just taking out the hard-coded number three, which is concrete and specific, or what here should be five. I'm taking out the number five, and I'm asking Python to do something instead. That's a little bit more abstract than me just typing in five. But it's this move towards abstraction that makes my code stronger. Now my loop works always, no matter whether my ice cream list has 20 or whether my ice cream list has one or even zero. My loop will always work. The change of my ice cream freezer in the real world does not mean that I have to go in and change my Python code. I have not tied my Python code so tightly to the status of my ice cream freezer that my code breaks every time I go to the grocery store. Now, this is called abstraction. And so what happens is I'm removing the things in my code that make it brittle or breakable. And I start replacing them with concepts and ideas and representations or here things that Python can calculate, which make my code more flexible, more adaptable, and it doesn't break and cause errors for me all the time. My code is more robust than it used to be. Now, I did put some abstraction in there, and sometimes it's this abstraction that really catches humanists, and humanists, I find, kind of don't like that. And here's really where my soapbox is, that this idea of substituting abstract concepts, variables, functions for really concrete numbers like 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 that humanists interpret this as something like math. It's like a flashback to algebra, like back to grade seven, when suddenly X had a solution, but you couldn't figure that out. And you're like, well, why can't I just work with the numbers themselves and put that into a spread, whatever, 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 right? Well, I understand that. And people who are really good at explaining their anxieties have explained to me that this is actually the anxiety of math, is that is this, this anxiety about substituting variables or concepts or representations for numbers and that abstraction really is what freaks them out. But here's what I want to say. As humanists, we do this all the time. You know, we just came out of a theory class. We we're working on like post-colonial literary theory, or we just took semiotics, or we came out of a gender studies class, right? We're we're thinking in the social sciences about what it means to do quantitative research versus qualitative research, right? We're, we're doing interviews and we know that we have to have these ethics clearances. All of that is abstract. You have people who come like out of a Victorian literature class and think, well, you see, you can't really understand what H.G. Wells is doing in the War of the Worlds until you understand the British Empire and the status of post-colonialism in 1898. 
that seems to make sense to us. But then we get over to <laughs> programming and we take out the number five and we put in length of ice cream and everybody flips a lid. So I think that there's a lot to be studied here. And I think that I just wanted to mention this and get on my soapbox because if this is the thing that's causing you anxiety about programming, um, it's really just a concept of abstraction. And so we can start to think about abstraction, we can deal with abstraction, we can work with abstraction. It isn't just what we're doing math, but we have a goal. We're working towards a goal. We want our code to be flexible. We want it to be robust. We need to kind of allow our code to figure things out for itself. We can't hold its hand all the time. Rather than telling it how many indexes there are, Let's let Python figure out how many indexes there are. And once it starts to do that, that absolves us of responsibility for the code. The code becomes flexible. It becomes adaptable. It can respond to the real world around it. And we're not always making it break. And we don't have to be called in when it breaks so that we can fix it. All right. <laughs> Enough of that. End of soapbox. End of abstraction. We'll move on to the next video, which is going to be um, looking at uh, exactly the same process, iterating a list. But we're going to use the second of Python's uh, loop structures, which is called a for loop. Thanks.